take a few minutes and share some thoughts with you from God's Word. I want to begin, if you have your Bible, have you turned to Matthew chapter 12 tonight? Matthew chapter 12. And uh, I just want to share a few verses initially from Matthew 12. Uh, we'll be looking at just a few verses, 31 to 35. But as you're turning, you know, I try to apply all the sermons that I preached to myself. But this one especially is for me because if I'm honest, the greatest visible area of sin in my life is my words. But that's not the main area of my personal sin. Jesus said in verse 34 of Matthew 12, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. In other words, it's the invisible area of my life where my sinful words originate. And if I'm going to be right outwardly, then I'm going to have to have my inward life right with God before anything else. He says, out of the abundance of the heart. The heart is the deepest, the innermost part of me. It's where my thoughts are formed. It's where my feelings are felt and where my desires are. And it is that part of me that impacts my decisions or my choices are made. And my thinking affects my feelings and my desires and that, uh, that touches the decisions that I make. So if I'm going to talk right, then I have to think right. I have to, like they say, think before I speak. Since my thinking takes place in my heart, I guess I have a heart problem. And I'm incapable of changing my own heart. James 3, which we will look at in a moment, James 3 connects talking right with thinking right. The first 12 verses of James 3 is all about our words. And then the last part, verses 13 to 18, is all about our wisdom, which, of course, comes from our thinking, which comes from our heart. So because my words come out of my heart, I must first of all be sure that I have a good heart. I've had you turn to Matthew chapter 12. And uh, in Matthew tw chapter 12, I believe, personally, I don't have proof, but I believe that Matthew chapter 12 may very well be the basis for the instruction that James gives us in James chapter 3. Because this passage is all about words. Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees who have just spoken blasphemous words. And uh, he has just healed a demon-possessed man that prior to that healing couldn't speak a single word. But after the demon is cast out, he's able to speak words. And Jesus says, verse 35 of Matthew 12, either to the Pharisees, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. And he says this to them, Pharisees, these religious Jewish leaders, O oh, generation of viper snakes, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of his of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. Now I want you to note in that 35th verse what a good heart really is. A good heart really is found 
in a good man. See that in verse 35? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. A good man. You remember there was a young man that came to Jesus and he said, good teacher uh, or master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' first response to that young man was, why do you call me good? <laughs> There's none good but God. So if Jesus calls a person a good man, what is a good man? A good heart is the heart of a good man. And a good man is a godly man. A good man is a man that is right with God. A good man is a man, a person, if I can put it like that, that possesses God's heart, that possesses God's righteousness. You know how to be a good man or a good woman or a good person, however you want to term it. You have to have a saving personal relationship with Jesus, the Messiah. You can't be a good man without salvation. If you're not saved by trusting in Jesus and what he accomplished for you on that tree, you're not a good man. Regardless of the good works that you have done, regardless of all the good things that you have said, regardless of all the good things that you might be able to point to, in God's eyes, there is none good except God. And the only person that God would call good is someone that is trusting in and relying wholly upon the righteousness of God himself. That's a good man. He says this, if you have a good heart, not only are, are you a good man, but out of that good man's heart comes good treasure. See that in verse 35? What is it that results in goodness coming out of a man's heart? How, what good treasure comes out of a good man's heart? Good treasure, I believe, is a heart that is right with God, that is God-focused, that is God-centered, and that is focused on all that is God's things. I think the good treasure that comes out of a good heart uh, from a good man is all the things that pertain to God. Everything that pertains to God is the treasure that comes out of a good man's good heart. He calls it in that 35th verse, good things, good things. And it's in the context of our words. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so I believe the good things that uh, come out of that God-focused heart that are part of that treasure is godly talk that everything that we talk about, even if, it, even if it's mundane, even if it's secular, whatever we talk about, somehow it's connected with God. If we're talking about uh, something that is beautiful, it somehow has a connection with God and His beautiful creation or the beauty of His person. Good things. A good heart. A good heart is the basis for the right kind of talk. But not only a good heart, but if you'll jump over with me then to uh, James chapter 3, in the second part of that chapter, I've said 13 to 18 is about wisdom. 1 to 12 is about words. 13 to 18 is about wisdom. Wisdom has to do with the way you think. Wisdom has its roots in your thinking. And the heart is the place where you think. And so I believe if we are going to have the right kind of wisdom, because there are two kinds of wisdom in those verses that James talks about. There is a worldly wisdom, an earthly wisdom, which he says is devilish. It's demonic. It has its source, earthly wisdom as he deemed eight, that has its source in demons. Earthly wisdom isn't God's wisdom. And uh, so we need a guarded heart, not only a good heart, but a guarded heart. You remember the proverb? Keep your heart, literally guard your heart, keep your heart with all diligence, because out of it are the issues of life. Everything flows out of the center of your innermost being, your heart. 
That place that I said a moment ago is where you think. It's your mind. It's, it's your, your feelings. It's your desires. It's your ambitions. It's your choices and your decisions. Everything flows out of that. So guard your heart is what uh, the writer of Proverbs says. Protect, can I put it this way? Protect your thought life. Paul would say it this way. He says, bring every single thought into the captivity of Christ. Be sure that, that Christ has your thought life in his captivity, in his hold. Protect your thought. Have a guarded heart is what I'm trying to communicate to you. And I would uh, mention the fact that uh, Paul tells us in the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians, I think, is a personal thank you note that he wrote while he was under house arrest, he was sheltered in place, if you will. But that fourth chapter, Paul demands that we be joyful and that our lives be balanced, not over the edge or over the top on things, but joyful and balanced and without anxiety and fear and worry, that we would enjoy God's peace and God's contentment and at the core of that, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, I want you to look at that verse with me because I want you to see very clearly that right at the center of a guarded heart is your thought life. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think, think on these things. Think on these things. Be careful what you permit to enter into your mind. Guard your heart. We need... We need to stand guard duty. We need to stand as a sentry to censor what we allow to pass through the gate and enter into our thoughts. He says in Philippians 4.8, think on these things. Be aware, there is a, a raging battle for your mind in your thought life. That's where the battleground really is. It all begins in your mind. It all begins in your heart. It all begins in that, in that, uh, that, that, uh, that fortress within you. So guard your heart. Be careful what you focus your thoughts on. Be careful what you feed on. Because... If your mind is un if your heart is unguarded, if you have an uncontrolled mind, you're going to have an uncontrolled tongue. And there are six commands in Philippians 4:8 for wholesome thoughts. And what I what I've thought about and discovered is that all six of those are completely the opposite of our current media. And that's a problem. Because media is what we, of, uh, what we oft mostly feed our minds on, right? And these six things are just the opposite of what you're reading on the media, what you're seeing in media. Look at them with me as quickly as I can. What are you to think on? These things, what are they? Number one, whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are true? You have a hard time, I think, finding truth in much of the media today. Not focused on what's dishonest. Don't focus on what's untrue. Don't focus on what's fake. But focus on what's honest. Focus on what's accurate. Not what someone's opinion is. Not what someone's prejudice is. But what's true. And then, what sort of things are honest. And the word there means not what's the lowest, not what's disgraceful. Don't focus on that, but focus on high things. Focus on noble things. Focus on honorable things and respect, respectful things. 
What else, if we're going to guard our heart, our thinking, should we be focused on? What sort of things are just? That is, we're not dwelling on what's wrong, but we're, we're dwelling on what God says is right. Not what I say is right, not what someone else says is right, but we, we are dwelling on, we're thinking on what God by his standard in the Bible says is right. Just. And then what sort of things are pure? That is, <laughs> we're, not, we're not thinking about sleaze. We're not, uh, we're not thinking about suggestive things and innuendos and impurity, but we're thinking clean and wholesome thoughts. Next one, think on what sort is lovely, not what's disgusting. There's a lot of disgusting stuff out there to capture our thought life. No. On, we should be thinking on things that are lovely, not disgusting, but things that are appealing, things that promote friendliness. And then he says we should be thinking on things that are of good report, not despicable things, but things that are admirable, things that are positive, things that are constructive and commendable of good report. And then these six commands uh, for our thought life are described in the closing words of that eighth verse of Philippians 4 by saying, these things are virtuous. That is, they're excellent. They fulfill the purpose for which God made you if you guard your heart and think on these things. And they are praiseworthy. They're not dirt because... They all cleanly capture your heart, your thoughts. Which leads me to one final point. That is this. You need a good heart. If your words are going to be right, you need a good heart. You have to guard your heart. And if your heart is guarded, the first 12 verses of James 12, the first 12 verses, if you are thinking on these things that Paul talks about in Philippians 4.8, then it's going to guide all of your talk. It's going to guide all of your words. It's going to guide all of your social media. It's going to be the basis where which your thoughts that you allow into your heart are going to be edifying thoughts and not thoughts that tear down and destroy you or others. Your words will be filtered through edifying thinking. And uh, that's necessary because our words are hard to restrain and they're destructive. According to the first 12 verses of James, our words are hard to restrain and often they're very destructive and they appear confusingly inconsistent. Out of the same mouth comes bitterness and blessing. That's not supposed to happen. It's not supposed to be, James tells us. That's confusingly inconsistent. So, let me give you, in closing, a few practical guidelines for talking. We need a good heart. We need a guarded heart. And if we have that, we then will have guided words. So here's just a few practical thoughts for words. Before you speak them, ask yourself three questions. You know, <laughs> I always think of this too late. Weigh your words before you speak them. First question you should ask yourself before you speak, is it true? Is it true? Am I speaking the truth to this person or I'm just trying to flatter them? Is it true that I'm speaking or is it just rumor and gossip? Is this true what I'm saying or am I exaggerating it and embellishing it? Is it true? It's not just opinion. It's not just something that I've heard, but it's actual truth. Secondly, not only is it true, we should ask ourselves, is it kind? Is it kind? 
is what I am speaking, does it communicate caring and considerateness and courtesy and compassion and encouragement? Is what I say going to make that person feel good? Is it something that I would like to hear them say to me? So is it true? Is it kind? And the third thing is this. Is it necessary? Is it necessary? Is it just negativity? Is it just a complaint? Is it just a grievance? Is it... Uh, uh, is it... Uh, is it worth saying? Does it have to be said? Is it necessary? Is now the time? Is it being said for you or for them? Is it necessary? And if it doesn't pass that test, those three tests, then I think it'd be best to be silent. You know, that, I think, is a time when silence could really be called golden. All I know is that I regret something that I said that I shouldn't have. I remember one particular occasion, all I said was one word, I said no. I was asked if I had uh, done something, not anything morally wrong, but something that perhaps wasn't ethically the best. And when I was asked about it, I answered no. Just one little word. Problem with it was, it was a lie. What conviction that night? What conviction? And all the embarrassment the next day when I had to admit to that person that I had lied and ask their forgiveness. Not worth it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We need a good heart if good things are going to come out of this mouth. And I've told you how to have a good heart. We need a guarded heart. And Philippians 4, 8 tells us what we are to think on, which will give you a guarded heart. And then, as I've just shared, these practical things if we'll do that, out of a good heart, out of a guarded heart, we'll have guided words. Our words will be what they ought to be. They'll please God. I would simply say this. You can't do that. You can't control your tongue. That's what James tells us in the first 12 verses. No man can control their tongue. They would be a completely spiritually mature person if they were able to do so. I haven't achieved that level of maturity yet. Have you? We need God. If we are going to use these tongues for good instead of for evil, if blessing is going to proceed out of, out of this mouth instead of bitterness, we need God to do a work in our heart because it is out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you might just use these simple words from Scripture, simple truths to impact and to make a difference in the way that we talk. Lord, we don't talk right. Often we don't talk right. We don't have the right tone. We don't have the right verbiage. We offend in word as well as indeed. Lord, I pray that you would search our hearts. We can't do that. We're asking you to do it. Search our hearts. You said, out of a good heart comes good treasure. Out of an evil heart comes evil things. Search our hearts. Cleanse our hearts as we acknowledge and confess and invite you to forgive and to cleanse. And you will. Guard our hearts, Lord. May we not fill them up with the garbage of this world in the media, 
But may we be focused on those things of Philippians 4, 8. Set a watch upon our mouth. Keep the doors of our lips. Use our tongues to glorify you. May the words of our mouth be right in your sight because the meditation of our heart is right. In Jesus' name, amen.